Psalm 132, and we'll be looking at the 18th verse here in just a few moments. I want to welcome you to our services today and uh, just tell you that the Lord is good. He's on his throne. This world's in a mess, but God excels in fixing messes. God is the one who has a remedy for sin. He has a remedy for all of man's problems, and that's in the person and ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you don't know him as your Savior, I, I just would say today, make that decision. Repent of your sin. Call upon the Lord Jesus for salvation. Jesus said, he that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. So in other words, the door's open. And in fact, Jesus said, behold, I stand at the door for your heart and knock. And he wants you to open your heart's door to him. This morning, I want to preach about King Jesus. And uh, just before we begin, let's uh, bow in prayer and I'll get to the, the verse here in just a few minutes. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for this opportunity to again meet in your house of prayer and praise. Uh, Lord, we just uh, dedicate this time to you. And I just ask Holy Spirit that you have your way in this service. Lord, God, help me to preach those things that you would uh, want me to preach and to emphasize those things that are of importance for eternity. Help us, dear Lord, to uh, look at our world situation and our nation's situation with clear and open eyes of understanding so that we might know what to do. Lord, I pray that through this message, Jesus Christ would be lifted up, that you'd be exalted, and that hearts would turn toward you because you and only you have the words of eternal life. You are the only one who can bring salvation to the lost of this world. So please bless this preaching time and bless the hearts of all who listen. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. 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 Folks, Jesus Christ is the focus of all of God's Word. The Bible reveals so much to us. It shows us how great our sin is, but it also reveals how great God's love is. It reveals to us how great the Lord Jesus Christ is because He was willing to come to Calvary's cross and to die for us. It shows us how great God's salvation is because he's presented his salvation to a fallen race of human beings that were destined for the fire of eternal judgment, the fire of hell. The major theme of all Bible prophecy is the conquest of the Lord Jesus Christ and his glory and his ultimate triumph. The scriptures say that evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, yet one day soon, King Jesus is going to return. He's returning to take possession of his bride, the New Testament church, and returning to take possession of this earth, this planet, once and for all. There's one promise that I wanted to share with you this morning out of Psalm 132 in the 18th verse, and it's one of the promises of the victory that he will have. The scripture says, His enemies will I clothe with shame, and upon himself shall his crown flourish. His enemies will I clothe with shame, and upon himself shall his crown flourish. Folks, ever since the Lord Jesus Christ left planet earth and ascended back into glory, his enemies have increased. His enemies have waxed worse and worse. But he shall destroy his enemies, and he shall be crowned king of kings, and Lord of Lords, and I believe I'm going to be there to see that happen. In fact, all of God's children, all Christians, will be there to witness the event. And I would dare say that all of this universe will be present to witness that too before the wicked are thrown into that lake of fire. So in Psalm chapter 8, the part of verse number 5 says, "...and has crowned him with glory and honor." And we looked at that passage in the opening of our service today uh, in our printed text in the bulletin. So the Father is going to one day set all enemies under the feet of Jesus. He will exalt those, uh, those uh, excuse me, he would exalt the Lord Jesus Christ by crowning him 
with crowns, but he will diminish and vindicate uh, the word of truth that is preached unto you and, and diminish the power of evil and uh, do uh, basically cast that devil into the lake of fire uh, that uh, was designed for all of eternity. So uh, in Psalm chapter 110, in the first verse, the Lord said unto my Lord, David here is talking, and when he says the Lord, he's talking about Jehovah the Father, said unto my Lord, Jehovah the Son, God the Son, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. In Hebrews 10, verses 12 and 13. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever. And I'm glad Jesus doesn't have to go back through the cross again. When he said, it is finished. And when he died there in Calvary's cross, the work of our salvation was complete. It's just now a matter of people accepting what Christ did for them by faith. After uh, he had once, uh, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God, from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. I'll tell you people, the world is not any closer to accepting the Lord Jesus today than it has been in the past. And maybe in some respects it's even farther away. Turning farther and farther from the God of this universe. I think you would agree with me that we live in days of evil and darkness. The devil and his demonic host are at work on a massive scale to deceive even, if it were possible, the elect of God. I don't know who the Antichrist is, but I'll tell you, I believe that he's alive right now and that Antichrist is orchestrating the overthrow of the United States of America in order to build the kingdom of Antichrist, this one world government. The evil powers and money are pushing us down a cliff of massive destruction to enslave the world in the kingdom of darkness and wickedness. And I'm just going to be frank with you this morning. We're only a couple of weeks away from our presidential election, which I believe is the most important election in, in the history of this country. Amen. I really do. The Democratic Party has been working overtime to shut down churches, to keep pro-life Supreme Court nominee off of the court. They push baby-killing abortions even up to the moment of birth and even after the birth if some of them get their way. They're prosecuting Christians and Jews and trying to overthrow our duly elected president. And they've been working on Trump now for nearly four years. The Democratic governor of New York, Cuomo, ordered the iron gates of a Jewish cemetery in New York City to be welded shut to keep them out of the cemetery. That's religious persecution. Not only that, but I saw a video just a couple days ago of somebody who I guess was driving down the street and pulled out their phone to take a video of New York government officials who were there knocking and trying to look in through the windows of a Jewish synagogue and school, trying to see if there might be any Jewish people gathered together in prayer and in teaching of the children because they were ready to arrest them. This is supposed to be the United States of America. Our very first amendment, the first amendment guarantees first and foremost the right to freedom of religion, not freedom from religion. And yet the Jews and Christians are being persecuted by these liberal progressive leftists. For nearly four years, the news media has been working in concert with the Democratic Party trying to remove Donald Trump from his presidency. They're, they've tried what is called a coup. It's a French word, but it means an overthrow of a government. But I want to thank the Lord that many of their schemes have backfired on them in one way or another. And it seems like what they accuse our president of, they themselves are guilty of the same thing and even worse. The lying media is covering up the truth to push the lies of the devil. And remember, Jesus said that the devil is a liar. He has been from the beginning, and he is the father of all lies. I believe that God placed President Trump in our presidency, that it was a, a divine appointment. In fact, Donald Trump, in an interview quite a few decades ago, said uh, that, that he might be open to running for president if he felt led to do so. And more recently, he's admitted that, yes, this fact of him running in 2016 and again in 2020 is a calling. I believe God has led him to America for such a time as this. 
Maybe it's in order for the Lord to give America another chance for our country to get right with the Lord. Amen? If you thought Hillary was bad, and she is, she was, and she still is, I want to tell you, you might have no idea of how evil Joe Biden and his cohorts are. More and more is coming out in the press lately from a laptop that belonged to Joe's son, Hunter Biden, that reveals a lot of their criminal activity and their, their lying schemes. And uh, uh, that's just part of the story. I saw in a, uh, an interview Joe Biden gave recently with a, a news uh, interviewer. He was stating there, I saw him and I heard with my own ears, saying that if seven and eight-year-old children are questioning their sexual identity, he thought it was okay to let them pursue that, to, uh, to t transgender, to change from male to female or female to male. Folks, that's wrong. That's of the devil. That's not of God. The Bible clearly says in Genesis chapter 1 that in the beginning God created them male and female. And God doesn't make mistakes. We do. Sin does. The consequences of our sin brings a lot of mistakes. But they, uh, they, they're trying to push this on the children who don't understand any of this to get them to question their sexual identity. At the age of eight or seven, they have no clue as to how to think like an adult. And they're easily uh, persuaded by those liberal teachers and, and professors. The Bidens have been paid millions of dollars by China, Iran, and Russia, and other countries in return for the, uh, the influence that Joe Biden could provide uh, during his vice presidency under the Obama administration. And he and Hunter have put the United States in jeopardy by working with our enemies for all those millions of dollars. Just a couple days ago, I downloaded a document that I found online called the Unity Task Force Recommendation. This is basically the Biden-Sanders Democrat platform agreement. It's 110 pages long, and I haven't gotten very far through it, but it is basically reading about the same as a communist manifesto. They want to totally change America, totally change the world. They want to turn us into a, a communist, basically, world empire. And I wonder sometimes, who is the puppet master who's behind the scene, pulling on the strings, controlling these things, controlling Biden and Harris and maybe others? And in fact, it almost seems like part of their plan may be to get good old Joe elected as president and then have him declared incompetent or have him step down so that Harris could take over to become the, the president for nearly four years. However this works out, if he is elected and if the Democrats take control, you may as well say goodbye to our Constitution and say goodbye to the uh, freedoms that we have as Americans because it's gone. This country is right there on the brink of being toppled over as they're working right here in front of our eyes. Psalm 132, verse 18. The first part of that verse, His enemies will I clothe with shame. I believe a lot of what's being revealed here lately as some of this truth of this corruption is coming out, I think the Lord's had a hand in it. You know, the Bible says, be sure your sin will find you out. But there's no sin that's covered. And I think the Lord is uncovering a lot of this evil and wickedness just to encourage his people and let us know that God's still there and he's still on the throne. He still is in control. Isaiah chapter 5, verses 20 through 23 Isaiah wrote, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes and the prudent in their own sight. Woe unto them that are mighty to drink wine and men of strength to mingle strong drink, which justify the wicked for reward and take away the righteousness of the righteous from him. I've never suggested and never will suggest that Donald Trump is a perfect example. I like what Pastor Robert Jeffress of First Baptist a Church in Dallas said uh, after the last election. He said, we didn't elect him to be the nation's pastor, but we elected him to be the nation's president. There's a lot that he's done that I admire. He doesn't drink. He does not drink any alcohol. Doesn't smoke. He doesn't take pay from the United States except a little bit of a minimum amount. 
in fact, you can say that, that Donald Trump has given up a lot of his riches to become president. He's giving of his work and his labor, working longer hours and harder than any president in, in the history of this country that I know of. And yet it seems like his opponent is doing all he can, not putting anything into it, but wanting to take the riches of America away from us instead of contributing to our nation. I, I think that never has America been so far away from the Lord as it is now. We need revival in our land. That's why I put a story or two there in the bulletin about the need for revival, the need to never forget God. And we have a promise from God that 2 Chronicles seven fourteen is still in the Bible. And Linda Daniels is going to think I, I mentioned that in my message because she brought it up earlier, but no, I didn't. It, it was in my message to, to share today. That verse, 2 Chronicles seven fourteen says, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven. I'm glad that God hears us. Amen. And we'll forgive. When we genuinely repent of our sin, God will forgive. And then he said, and heal their land. America needs some healing in our land today. We need some help. Amen. But it's conditional. It's that God's people has to hear. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves, a humble and contrite heart, O Lord, thou wilt not des despise, the psalmist said. We've got to, in humility, pray and repent of our sin and the sin of our nation and turn from our wicked ways. And then and only then, as we seek his face, does he promise that he will forgive and, and that he will hear and heal our land. Luke 17, Jesus compared his day with the days of Noah and Lot. And it's very much so that way today. Luke 17, verse 26, And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it, also, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. And then starting in 28, Likewise also as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded. But the same day that Lot went out of the Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Fire and brimstone. That's what hit Sodom and Gomorrah on the cities of the plain. Fire and brimstone. Jesus talked about the fact that hell is a place where the fire is not quenched, or the thirst is not quenched, and, and the fire is not going to go out. And then the ultimate destiny for all the lost is going to be in that lake of fire. Fire and brimstone. By the way, brimstone is burning sulfur. I don't know if you've ever smelled sulfur when it burns. And it is strong. It's putrid. It will choke you with those gases Sulfur uh, forms sulfur dioxide and sulfur trioxide. And if you get it into your sinuses, into, through your nose or your mouth, it reacts with water to make either sulfurous or sulfuric acid, which is one of the strongest of the acids. It will burn you. And yet, that's how Jesus describes hell. As a place of fire and brimstone. He said, the day, same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. And likewise, it, it's going to be even thus, shall be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. When he comes back, it's going to be a judgment day. It's going to be a day of great fire and destruction. And folks, there's not a single prophecy that would lead me to believe that this present age is going to end up with the entire world converted to Jesus Christ. I can't find any verses like that in the Bible. There are some that hold to what is called a post-millennial position, that Jesus doesn't come back until after the 1,000 years of peace, and that it's his church that brings in the 1,000 years of peace. Folks, we can't do it. I don't believe that for a moment. I'm pre-millennial. I believe Jesus comes back, and then he will set up his 1,000-year kingdom of peace and perfection. And I'm also pre-tribulational. I believe he's coming back for his church before the tribulation. 
And as I said last week, I'm also prepared. I'm ready to go. And I hope that each of you are as well. Premillennial, pre-tribulational, and prepared. I don't know of any prophecy that would tell us that this world will all be saved before Christ can come back. Instead of a universal acknowledgement of Christ, there's going to be universal opposition and antagonism to him that's going to lead up to that battle of Armageddon that will take place when Jesus finally returns after that tribulation period. That huge battle. Is that going to happen? Is that true? Is that real? Yes, it is. Listen to what the psalmist wrote in Psalm chapter 2, starting with the second verse. The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. The Lord meaning God the Father, his anointed, referring to Jesus Christ the Son. Against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. In other words, they're saying, We are rebelling. We don't believe in God. We don't accept God. We're not going to bow the knee to the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to rebel. We're going to break any control that they have over us. That's what they think they're going to do at the Battle of Armageddon. <laughs> I've already read the book of Revelation. Folks, they lose. They lose. Big time. It's quite descriptive and maybe not so pleasant to hear just before lunchtime. But it talks about when Christ comes back, he will speak the word. A sharp two-edged sword comes out of his mouth. And uh, as he deals with those armies of man at the Battle of Armageddon, it says that the flesh is going to fall off of their bones and the blood will rise as high as a horse's bridle, which would be at about four feet deep for the, throughout that valley of Armageddon, the one that we call Armageddon, and throughout that valley that's nearly 200 miles long. And then the Lord Jesus is going to invite the birds, the fowl of the air to come and, and to eat a supper, eat of the flesh of those armies. That's a great supper of God. That's one supper I wouldn't want to be partaking of. But we don't have to because I think we're going to be eating supper with Jesus in glory. Amen. Amen. That's what God's word teaches us. So that a passage there in Psalm 2 about the kings of the earth taking counsel together, rising up, rebelling. That is the spirit of this age that we're living in today. The world rejects Christ, and so he rightly rejects them. If people are going to reject him, he's rejected them. They need to repent. People, you need to repent. As some people were talking to Jesus, telling him about how Pilate's soldiers had slain the blood of some Jews, some Galileans, as they were offering a sacrifice to God. And uh, then, then also the story was uh, of this tower in Siloam that collapsed and killed 18 men. And Jesus' response to both of those stories was except, meaning unless, except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Physical death isn't the end, folks. It's that eternal damnation in hellfire and the lake of fire. And people better wake up and realize that. So sadly, our colleges and universities and other institutions are reeking with infidelity, with unbelief. Anti-Christianity is frightfully on the increase. Jesus said iniquity shall abound. And, and folks, frankly, the worst is yet to come. In Matthew 24, as Jesus listed about the sorrows that would face people in the end times, he said that's just the beginnings of sorrows. It's going to get worse. Satan and the demons under him with other unseen forces of lawlessness are preparing rapidly for the final contact, uh, conflict when Satan's masterpiece, the man of sin, the Antichrist, will lead the world to unite in complete hatred of the Son of God. But wait a minute. What does the scripture say? 2 Thessalonians chapter number 1 starting with the seventh verse through verse number 12. Uh, no, excuse me, I'm going through verse 10. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, 
and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power, when He shall come to be glorified in His saints and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you is believed in that day. That's what's going to happen. While the kings of the earth rise up, while the Antichrist leads that final rebellion, while the devil thinks everything's working according to plan, then Jesus comes back in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those. God himself spoke to his son, the Lord Jesus, when he welcomed him to take his place at his own right hand. I've already used that scripture before, back from Hebrews. Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thine footstool. God himself will deal with Christ's enemies and will clothe them with shame. Remember our text verse from Psalm 138? His enemies will I clothe, excuse me, Psalm 132 verse 18. His enemies will I clothe with shame and upon himself shall his crown flourish. That's how God's going to deal with these people, these enemies of Jesus Christ. It will be in that supreme hour of human history when every controversy about the person of Christ will be forever settled. People will know and will acknowledge that he is God to the glory of God the Father, that he is King of kings and Lord of lords. It will be forever settled that hour in which he returns to earth, the earth in great power and glory. And frankly, his enemies are going to be licking dust. They're going to be on their faces before Jesus. The godless, the atheists, the murders, uh, all the liars, the wicked, and above all, the blasphemers will be silenced by the glory flash from above. He, it talks about the brightness of his coming, the brilliant light as Jesus comes in that flaming fire. And at that hour when he answers his enemies by his glorious coming, it will also bring his crowning day. He comes crowned with many crowns. In fact, the hymn writer put it like that. Crown him with many crowns. Lamb upon the throne. There is coming a crowning day. Jesus is waiting up yonder for that coming day. I would say he's waiting patiently. Because Jesus is waiting for the Father to say, it's time. And the Bible tells us that you and I should be waiting patiently for the coming of the Lord, waiting until that time. But his waiting and our waiting is soon going to end because Jesus promised in Revelation 22, Behold, I come quickly. He's coming again, folks. Jesus is coming again. Over 2,000 years ago, the angel Gabriel visited Mary and explained to Mary how through the power of the Holy Ghost, who would overshadow her, she will conceive and bear a son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And Gabriel, talking of Jesus, said, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. I'm talking about King Jesus. Let me give you two more passages and then I'll close. Psalm 24, verses 7 through 10. I have vivid memories of times when the my elementary teachers would read out of the Bible to us. And I remember how it stopped all of a sudden when I was in fifth grade. Mrs. Thomas was our fifth grade teacher. The reason it stopped was because of the Supreme Court. Saying you can't do it. And they put a stop to it, at least in the state of Pennsylvania. I think here in the South, y'all continued it for quite a while. <laughs> Amen. Amen. <laughs> and I'm glad the Lord moved me here to the South. I really am. This is one of the passages that she liked to read. And it really touched our hearts as she read through these verses. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. 
And then I want to share with you the last two verses of the book of Jude, verses 24 and 25. In fact, I'm going to ask you to stand and I'm going to use this as a, a prayer of benediction. And our musicians may come and prepare the invitation song. The church that I was raised in, the preacher would often give what is called a benediction at the end of the service. And this is one of the favorite ones, one that was often, often used. What chapter? Jude only has one chapter, verses 24 and 25. It says, Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling, and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power both now and ever. Amen. Amen. If you know the Lord Jesus as your Savior, then rejoice. You're a child of the King. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you don't have anything to rejoice about. But you do have an opportunity to get saved right now. To repent of your sin and call out on Jesus for salvation. If you need to do that, those who are here in our service, uh, this is now an altar call that I'm giving. If you need to come to the altar to pray, please do so. If you feel more comfortable to be there at your seat and pray, you may do so. Uh, we're going to have a song of invitation, and you just talk to the Lord. And if you're watching by way of video, make sure that you're right with the Lord. If you were to die today, would you go to heaven? Do you know? If you have a genuine Bible salvation, then you know. We have a no-so salvation. John said, but these are written, talking about the things in 1 John 5. These are written that ye may know that you have eternal life. I know that I know that I know. Do you know?